Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Remember to like and subscribe, and vote in the poll for less family drama. Maybe. Today we're building Luke Skywalker from a little movie series called Star Wars. It's kind of an under the radar thing, but for the few of you who have seen it, I'm sure this will be a real treat. Do I look like... <laughs> Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need a laser sword. Next, we need to be able to move things with some sort of force. Finally, we'll make sure that we can send ghosts of ourselves to deal with our overzealous nephews. For stats, we're using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll if you want, but multi-classing minimums can be kind of tricky with this build, so pay attention to them. Intelligence is number one. Luke's force powers develop as he studies them. Strength after that, he tends to two-hand the lightsaber, so I'll want that to be a long sword. Charisma will follow. Before you can study the force, you have to be sensitive to it, even if your sister is the better politician. Dexterity next, Luke tends to avoid heavy armor, and it's a good skill to avoid being killed. Constitution's on the lower end, it's just painful to drop and will dump wisdom. Luke isn't great at passing his knowledge on to the next generation. For race, variant humans are good, Luke is good, let's put those two puzzle pieces together. There aren't a ton of feats that stick out, so I'm just going to grab the athlete feat for plus one strength. You can jump with only five feet of movement, climbing doesn't cost you any extra movement, and you can stand up from prone with five feet of movement instead of half. Put your two free points into intelligence and strength, grab acrobatics for your skill of choice, take acolyte as your background for insight and religion proficiency. No guarantees on the shelter the faithful ability as your religion is pretty much dead and would be fully dead if you had your druthers. Speaking of dead religions, first level paladins can choose two skills from their list. I'd go for athletics and persuasion. You get healing hands, giving you a pool of healing you can use as an action with five times your paladin level in the tank for some sweet Jedi healing juice. You also get divine sense to figure out if there's a disturbance in the force within 60 feet of you in the form of a fiend, celestial, or undead an amount of times equal to your charisma modifier per long rest. Second level paladin is where the Jedi stuff really kicks in. You get a fighting style, go for great weapon fighting to reroll ones and twos on damage die with a weapon you're wielding two-handed, like a longsword. This is a versatile weapon, meaning it can be wielded two-handed, but it doesn't have to be if you want a free hand for spells. Spells like Divine Favor, which add 1d4 radiant damage to a weapon for one minute so your saber can have a little bit of light. If you want that saber to have extra light, Divine Smite adds 2d8 radiant damage to your attacks with an extra 1d8 against fiends and undead. So if Palpatine ever comes back, you can lay the smack down. Not that that would ever happen, I mean, how weird would that be? At third level of Paladin, you can pick a sacred oath, and what better to be a Jedi Knight than the Oath of a Crown, an oath specifically for knights. You get a channel of divinity once per long rest that you can either use for a champion's challenge, forcing a wisdom save of 8 plus your proficiency bonus and charisma modifier on creatures within 30 feet of you. If they fail, they can't willingly move more than 30 feet away from you. This is great if you want to distract your nephew and his evil army. The other option is turn the tide, healing allies within 30 feet of you 1d6 plus your charisma modifier if they're below half health. Remember, hit points aren't meat points. Rousing encouragement from the last surviving Jedi could be enough to bring someone back to their feet. Four level paladins get an ability score improvement, and dang, I kinda want all of them. Strength would be helpful, but Luke isn't really a power lifter, so going beyond 16 seems a little excessive. Invest in dexterity. He's good with a blast or two, and he doesn't wear heavy armor, so you'll need that for your AC as well. Fifth level paladins get an extra attack, so you can swing that saber a little faster. You can also learn second level paladin spells. Magic weapon makes a weapon magical for overcoming resistances, and gives you plus plus one to attack and damage rolls. Depending on the situation, this could be a better lightsaber than the Divine Favor one, as the D10 from your longsword gets to bypass resistances and your attacks are more accurate. It also lasts for an hour instead of a minute, which could help you save spell slots. Up to you, just don't say I didn't give you options. We'll head over to Wizard now that Luke has set up for all of his melee abilities. For your cantrips, Mage Hand lets you lift objects weighing five pounds or less or activate non-magical items. Light creates a bright light that you could affix to something, maybe your sword. I know carving through metal is a lightsaber's main job, but it's also a decent flashlight. Message lets you communicate with someone within 120 feet of you at a whispered tone. They can respond for some force connection communication. You have a spell book with six spells in it at the first level. These are sacred Jedi texts. Keep them somewhere non-flammable. Let's try to do these quickly. Jump triples your jump distance for one minute. Force jump. Shield adds five to your AC as a reaction. Lightsaber deflection. Long strider increases your movement speed by 10 feet per round. Force dash. Charm person charms a creature that fails a wisdom save of eight plus your proficiency bonus and intelligence modifier for a minute. Jedi mind trick. 
object. Catapult lets you pick up an object weighing 5 pounds or less within 60 feet of you and toss it in a 90 foot line, forcing a dexterity save on a creature it hits, dealing 3d8 bludgeoning damage force stapler throw. Thunder Wave forces a constitution save for creatures in a 15 foot cube, dealing 2d8 thunder damage and pushing the mac 10 feet if they fail. You take half damage on a success and aren't pushed. Boom, force push. Keep in mind, each day you can only prepare an amount of spells equal to your intelligence modifier and your wizard level, not counting those paladin spells. Since we're multi-classing spellcasters, remember to check out page 165 of the player's handbook to figure out how many slots you have at any given level. And feel encouraged to bump up the damage of that catapult or the thunder wave. Finally, you get arcane recovery, letting you recover spell slots equal to half your wizard level on a short rest, so you can be ready to go after a little meditation. Second level wizards can choose an arcane tradition. Yoda obviously schooled you in divination. You get two portents, which are d20s you roll at the start of each day, and you can replace a d20 roll later with one of those. Roll high, use it on yourself. Roll low, use it on an enemy. You can also grab two new spells every level for your spellbook. Feather Fall slows the falling speed of up to five creatures, so the force can keep you safe from fall damage. Expeditious Retreat lets you dash as a bonus action for up to a minute, so if you really need to book it, channel the force into your feet and get out of there. Third level wizards can learn second level spells. Hold Person paralyzes a humanoid of your choice that fails a wisdom save for up to a minute. You don't have to choke them like your dad would, but immobilizing is good. Levitate lets you lift an object weighing 500 pounds or less and move it 20 feet as a bonus action on the following turns. If the object is a person who doesn't want to levitate, they can roll a constitution save to resist. Falling from this height doesn't cause any falling damage, which is sad because that would be cool. But lifting an X-Wing out of the swamp is also cool, so you can still do cool things. Fourth level wizards get an ability score improvement. More intelligence improves your connection to the force, I'd go for that. For your spells, detect thoughts lets you read surface level thoughts of creatures within 30 feet of you, and you can probe deeper if they fail a wisdom save. You can manipulate their thoughts by asking questions, so this is perfect for interrogations. I'd also grab detect magic from the first level, letting you detect magical auras and what kind of magic is causing them. Force sensitivity means you should be sensitive to the force. Fifth level wizards can learn third level spells. Haste doubles a target's movement speed, gives them plus two AC, advantage on deck saves, and an extra action once per round. Using this on yourself, that's only one extra attack for a total of three rather than four. Keep in mind when this goes away, the target can't take actions or reactions for one round. For your other spell, non-detection makes the target you touch immune to detection from divination spells. So if you just want to chill out on an island nobody can find, go ahead, you've earned it. Sixth level divination Divination wizards get expert divination, meaning that when you cast a divination spell of second level or higher, you can regain a spell slot lower than the one you just cast. The highest spell level the recovered slot can be is fifth, so you can't go crazy with it. For your spells, counter spell automatically shuts down a spell of the third level or lower as a reaction, and can shut down higher spells with an intelligence check equal to 10 plus that spell's level. So use the force to end the force. In the interest of saving time, we're going to stop picking two spells every level and just grab something you'd like and add it. I won't sell anyone. Seventh level wizards can learn fourth level spells. Spells Locate Creature lets you sense a creature you know of, either a specific name or a type of creature, within a thousand feet and sense what direction it's moving in for an hour. Jedi don't tend to let people sneak up on them. Eighth level wizards get an ability score improvement, cap the intelligence to get as attuned to the force as possible. For this level's spell, Confusion forces a wisdom save on creatures in a 10 foot radius sphere. Failing that, they roll a d10 on each of their turns. On a 1, they use all of their movement to go in a random direction. On a 2 to 6, they do nothing that round. On a 7 to 8, they attack a random creature with a melee attack. And on on a 9 to 10, they get to act normally. The mind is a playground for a skilled Jedi, and this will let you rule the swing set, which is obviously the best part of any playground. Ninth level wizards can learn 5th level spells. Hold monster is like hold person without the humanoid restriction. I'd grab that. It's very good to hold a rancor so it doesn't hold you. 10th level divination wizards get the third eye, letting you give yourself some super perception as an action for the remainder of the day. You can get 60 feet of dark vision or 60 feet into the ethereal plane. Greater comprehension lets you read any language or see invisibility to see 10 feet of invisibility. For this level spell, telekinesis lets you move things with your mind as an action for up to 10 minutes. If the object is a person or being held by a person, contest your spell casting ability with their strength. You can move them 30 feet and objects can weigh up to 1,000 pounds, so even giant can fly. 11th level wizards can learn 6th level spells. True seeing gives you true sight for an hour, letting you see hidden doors and 120 feet of the ethereal plane, so you can trust the force to show you things as they really are. 12th level wizards get our last ability score improvement. I'm going to recommend constitution for better concentration and less dying. For your spell, contact other plane. 
You have to make an intelligence save of 15, or you take 66 psychic damage and go insane until you take a long rest. If you pass, though, you can talk to someone from another plane, perhaps a small green dude who trained you. This lasts for a minute, so just long enough to watch a tree burn down. The person you talk to will answer in short phrases, but out of order they may be, so be ready for that. 13th level wizards can learn 7th level spells. Project image creates an illusory copy of yourself within a 500 foot range. Not quite planet hopping like Luke's, but it's still pretty far. It can move twice as fast as you, and you can see and hear with its senses, and an investigation check against your spell save will reveal it's a fake, as would it taking any damage, but otherwise it's up for a full day depending on your concentration. This really only worked against Kylo for like 10 minutes max, but that's still helpful for getting the rest of the party to safety. 14th level divination wizards get greater portent for a third portent die for maximum re-rolling shenanigans. For your spell at this level, reverse gravity reverses gravity in a cylinder with a 50 foot radius and a 100 foot height. If a creature hits the ceiling, they take the same falling damage they would, and take falling damage when the spell ends as well. They can try and grab onto something with a deck save, otherwise they're going up. Our capstone is the 15th level of wizard for an 8th level spell. Power word stun automatically stuns a creature within 60 feet. They roll a constitution save at the end of their turn, but your wizard save is very high, so you should be able to get away or get some hits in while they're in a forced stupor. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you have a great amount of spells for controlling your enemies, either moving them, immobilizing them, or charming them. Being able to move when your enemy can't is a big advantage. Those spells are also very hard to resist with a maxed out modifier and the option to throw your bad portents at the enemy saves. If you've got a one or two, that basically is a guaranteed round of paralyzation. Finally, mixing Paladin with other spellcasting classes gives you a ton of high level smites to deal some massive radiant damage. For cons, your con is the con of all of your cons. So many of your spells are concentration, so holding a person and divinely favoring have to be done separately. You're also not great at maintaining concentration with only a plus one modifier. Finally, your HP is just above a hundred most likely, so you're a pretty frail knight. But hey, that's why you make sure your enemies don't move. Control the enemy position, get in the right spot, and use that radiant damage to carve through even the thickest of hides. Just remember, while patience is part of being Jedi, it's best to wrap fights up quickly. Otherwise, things could get chopped off hand. Sorry, out of hand. I can't talk today. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We make two builds every week. This week, we're redeeming Star Wars builds who almost made the cut. Vote for Darth Vader, Han Solo, or Mace Windu. And come back Thursday to see what happens when a toad is struck by lightning.